Okay, we are now live, so we can formally begin. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to our cell online. My name is Noor Fatma. I am the team lead for the Global Governance Institute at uh, our cell. Today, we'll be discussing Pakistan's economic insecurity and trying to unpack some of the longstanding economic troubles that our country is going through. We will retain a special focus on our continued reliance on IMF bailouts. Uh, we have gathered a very esteemed panel here and with them uh, together, we will delve into the question more specifically of Pakistan's current economic crises, the reasons behind our failure in reaching our true economic potential, as well as understand the wider international architecture when it comes to multilateral lending institutions and how the global South has historically engaged with such bodies. And if there are any lessons for Pakistan uh, moving onwards. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce our esteemed uh, panelists. First of all, uh, we have uh, Dr. Mushtaq Khan, who is the founder of Doctored Papers, a boutique advisory firm catering to the private sector with a specific interest in Pakistan's macroeconomy and how it's influenced by domestic politics, as well as regional and wider global developments. Dr. Mushtaq received his PhD in economics from Stanford University in 1996. Since then, he has worked as a consultant for international financial organizations, such as the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. He was also the chief economic advisor for policy development at the State Bank of Pakistan and chief economist previously at Bank al -Fala. After that, we have Ms. Sara Nizamani, who is a research fellow at IBA and currently is working at the World Bank Pakistan in the Social Protection and Jobs Division. She is also a research fellow at IBA Karachi and has previously worked with institutions such as Harvard University, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, and Hans Seidel Foundation Asia. Sara's research focuses on economic mobility, human development, and impact evaluations of development programs. She has a particular interest in studying inequality of, opportun of opportunities and is currently researching the welfare impacts of microfinance in SIN. Once again, uh, a very, very warm welcome to our panelists. And again, thank you so much for taking out the time to sit with me and unpack some of these issues. I will start with. Uh, the one question that has baffled most Pakistanis pretty much since uh, last year. It's a very simple question, but a very loaded one, I feel. Uh, will Pakistan default or not? Uh, I will open up this discussion with Dr. Mushtaq for his comments. And after that, we'll move to Ms. Sara for her to share her thoughts on this. Thank you. Yeah, well, that is a question that a lot of people have been asking. And the honest answer is you cannot say. Uh, a lot is contingent on, on the next several months in the state of the political situation and for an IMF program. I think one thing that most people would agree is Pakistan's external debt is unsustainable. So, the sort of repayment streams that we're looking at the next three or four years cannot be met given the sort of uh, financial conditions that you have to go to the country at this point. And Pakistan will require some form of restructuring. And we haven't moved on that. So to answer the question, I would say we're sort of in a period of sort of an extended period of positive. Uh, we will not be able to pay, but we will be working towards, you know, ensuring that our creditors, bilateral, market, everyone uh, is involved. It's not as if like Sri Lanka, one day you just decide and say, we want to that. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Ma'am Sarah, please share your thoughts on the same. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Noor. Thank you for the invite and your question. So uh, when you asked me this question, uh, will Pakistan default? You were basically asking me to predict the future. So if you ask me if there are indications of uh, default, if the numbers are really bad, so I can confirm, yes, numbers are really bad and it looks like that, yes, it will. But at the same time, your uh, federal finance ministry, which is the highest body, it confirms it again and again that it won't default. And um, 
only they can confirm this situation because this is more of an accounting question than an economics one. The government only knows if they have more bilateral options available. So in case that they are confirming again and again that they will not default, I would like to believe that they won't. That's a, I, I love the fact that we have such succinct answers to this really uh, loaded kind of a question. But um, moving onwards, uh, again, what would be the immediate or, me or medium term consequences of a default? We saw what unfolded in Sri Lanka. And uh, there's always that trouble that uh, there's always that concept, sorry, that more political trouble will follow uh, an economic default or more political and economic turmoil will uh, will result from such economic fallouts. In Pakistan, uh, what would be the medium or immediate term consequences? And are we in a position to be able to safely see through those consequences and then get our economy back on track? Uh, again, I'll start with Dr. Mushtaq and then uh, Ms. Sara, we can come to you. Uh, look, the first thing that happens is if you do fall in the air, you're going to have a panic. You're going to have a panic in the current stock market. Uh, there will be a lot of voting. There will be rumors of import shortages. Uh, things can get very chaotic. Uh, I think the responsible government at that point to stem the panic would have to declare some form of emergency. Um, we think fuel and certainly staple foods would have to be rationed to ensure that the state would be able to people don't become socially dislocated. Uh, the medium term implications, as I say, uh, really depends on our relationship with the fund and our relationship with our creditors. Okay? If we go in for a graduated, uh, so bringing everyone on board, then it may not be quite as dramatic. But the thing is, like, you know, I think at this point, you know, we haven't really taken the first few steps you know, towards doing this. I think it's the political chaos that you see in the country. But just to correct you, I mean, when you have a sudden default, I don't think you're going to have political chaos. In fact, uh, I think all the politicians who said run for cover. Uh, because a lot of these problems can be traced in their terms of power. So you will have some sort of authority trying to take care of the economy and the politicians sort of taking a back seat. That's such a fascinating uh, point that you raised because uh, what it seems in Pakistan is nobody wants to get to the topic of economics right now or an accounting question in, in, in these terms. There's the, the political debate is what we hear about uh, so much. And uh, again, a very, very key point that how so much of this rides on what kind of a relationship we have with the IMF and these multilateral institutions and other creditors, bilateral uh, countries that, or friendly countries as we like to call them who have uh, uh, given us money and bailed us out on previous occasions. We will definitely talk a little bit more about this, but ma'am, sorry, if you can further talk about this point, that would be great. Yeah, uh, the immediate uh, consequences will be that uh, Pakistan uh, will lose uh, confidence of its uh, international market, which means that the government will no longer be able to borrow or attract any kind of uh, foreign investment. Uh, for common people, you will see a lot of uh, uh, extended power cuts, which means more blackouts, which will translate into less economic activity. Inflation will further erode the uh, purchasing power of the people, which is already uh, affecting the standard of living. Currency will uh, go down in a downward spiral, which means that Pakistan, Pakistan will, be, will further depreciate. Uh, then there will be lack of uh, life-saving drugs and equipment and medical facilities, um, longer fewer fuel lines for private transport. Public transport will be probably available, but it will be difficult to get fuel in your private cars. Food choices, which I think is something, uh, food choices and uh, school dropouts. This would be something that would be, uh, this is going to affect a lot of millions of uh, salaried and lower uh, middle-income Pakistanis which will actually have long-term effects. And if you look at uh, medium-term consequences, then of course it will be 
uh, economic contraction, your GDP growth is already expected to grow less than 1%. And with the inability to import any kind of machinery or raw materials, this means that uh, there will be joblessness. And um, this can also further make the politi political uh, instability and result in social unrest. And then there will, of course, be austerity measures, uh, which means that you will see significant spending cuts, there will be tax increases, there will hopefully some kind of structural reform. And uh, the, th the biggest alarm, alarm bells would, for me would be less uh, spending on your social protection programs, which uh, could have, again, long-term consequences for Pakistan. One other, another thing we might see is privatization of uh, state-owned enterprises because, of course, there'll be no the state will have no longer money to operate them. Um, so yeah, that will happen too. Uh, the, again, a very very harrowing picture, but um, much needed reality check in my opinion. And coming from uh, what a lot of other experts are talking about is the fact that. A lot of people believe that this default could serve as a deep reset for the economy, and it could actually serve as uh, a tipping point where stakeholders will get on the same page and actually undertake some of the structural reforms. I'm so glad you used that term because, again, I feel like that's a very loaded discussion that's going to come up next. Um, but do you, in your opinion, um, honestly feel that a default could serve as a deep reset, a much needed deep reset for the economy with, of course, very, very uh, painful, um, uh, a painful reality in the immediate and the medium terms, but in the longer term, perhaps it could serve as a basis of something more fruitful? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, I actually think that would be the silver lining this reset, because we've been sort of pushing the same model um, for three decades. Structural um, reform to the IMF taking back in the late 80s, and uh, we haven't really achieved much. So I think like, you know, the reality once you hit the wall is, is going to be very sobering and I think it's necessary. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the orientation of the economy has to change. This acute uh, import dependency that we have, uh, that has to change. Uh, I think on the positive side, Pakistan is tend to be very entrepreneurial. So, you know, things that we would otherwise import, we may start manufacturing them locally, a lot of raw materials, intermediate goods. And I think that's the sort of motivation that may be required because, as we've seen in the past several decades, uh, you will have a positive shock, like you know, 9-11, even COVID-19. And uh, you will all of a sudden find yourself flush with dollars or uh, facing low commodity prices. And what we end up doing is we go up into a binge, so sort of growth phase for a year, import a lot, create a mass payment crisis, and so you achieve 6 7% growth, and then you slump to 1, 2, even negative growth. Now, that's been done all the time. And I think a reset of this form is required because I think the business model that is being used in Pakistan is not sustainable. And uh, that reset is, is required, and it's just in the, the minds of the privacy. Right. Uh, Ma'am Sarah, uh, moving over to you. Yeah, so your question that uh, will it uh, deep reset or not? So uh, before I answer this question, I want to point to a very interesting study by two American economists. Uh, their name is uh, Kerman Reinhardt and Ken uh, Rogoff. And uh, they converted their uh, study uh, in a book, which is called uh, This Time is Different. And uh, the study is of, um, it's, it's looking at 66 countries across five continents and eight centuries of data of government defaults, banking, panics and inflationary, uh, inflationary uh, spikes. So um, they write, and I quote, that sovereign defaults on external debt have been almost a universal right of passage for every country that has matured from an emerging market economy to an advanced developed economy. Uh, in fact, uh, one graph in their book shows that 30 to 40% of the countries 
India sample have uh, defaulted often for a decade or sometimes on a multiple occasion in the last 200 years. So external de default is a problem, but then it's also a common thing. So external default and then there's a very interesting thing that they that they do that they have shown that external default debt default is actually a high fertility uh, country problem. It has occurred in countries where fertility is not too high, but it's it's rare there. It's more common in countries where high fertility. We talk about this in when we talk about long term issues of Pakistan. But the question about resetting uh, is again a prediction question. Because see, it's a personal choice. It's not an ideal situation, but it's definitely a situation to do better, to bring uh, fiscal discipline. You can bring institutional reforms, state-owned en enterprises can work better. But at the same time, uh, Pakistan has showed a tendency to um, uh, deliberately waste its opportunity. So yeah, would it use it or not use it is something that we'll know with time. That's a, a very fascinating thing. And it's very rare to hear of something as big as an external default as a universal right of passage and something that every country, especially one with more economic potential is expected to go through. Uh, so thank you so much for sh sharing that with me. Um, uh, Dr. Mushtaq, just a slight technical question. Uh, there's a little bit of a problem with your audio. It's a uh, it was all right in the audio check prior, but it's a little hard to hear you. So perhaps if you can speak a little bit louder uh, for the benefit of our audience. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is better. It's 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 a bit better. Yes, thank you. This is I think uh, this current discussion has uh, kind of laid the groundworks uh, for again going back to what was said earlier, uh, having good uh, relations with the IMF and now trying to understand what it is that we want from the IMF in this extended fund uh, facility. Um, so my first question is again, what are the demands? What do we want from the IMF this time? And again, we've, uh, we've approached the IMF and we've received IMF uh, funding 22 times prior to this current situation. So are we asking for anything different this time around? And uh, and in, in very, very simple terms, what is it that we're asking the IMF to do? Just give us money. And when it does give us that money, where will all this money go? In, in simple terms, if you can uh, throw light on this, I'll follow the same format. I'll start with Dr. Mushtaq and move on to Mamsar. Thank you. Um, look, the IMF since the late 80s, if you go back to the reform documents, I've been saying the same thing. So the past 23 programs really haven't changed because we've been asking for the same thing that need to be done and we haven't done them. So let's talk about what the structural reforms are. But okay. the thing is, the way I would frame it is you should think of structural reforms as trying to change bad habits. Right? It's not easy. It creates anxiety. It creates stress. It's difficult. And you need a lot of work. Now, you know, that's exactly what they want. I mean, they're saying that, look, you know, you have a country where people think paying taxes is an option. We are perhaps the only country on this planet that has a concept called non finance I mean, this doesn't exist anywhere. Taxes, as Benjamin Franklin said, the two things, two certain things in life, right? death and taxes, and we think taxes are an option. That's a bad habit. That has to change. The other bad habit, we are acutely import dependent. We don't manufacture anything, we prefer to import. In the past, we've been able to, and then you have the cycle of the payment crisis, so the economy cannot sustain suitable growth for more than two or three years, right? And then you have a bus. Then we have, I think, what I would call an uncompetitive, and I would actually say a lazy export sector. Uh, they've been exporting the same things for the past three decades. Uh, they are unable or unwilling to go off the value added chain. Increasingly, the export sector or the textile sector is focusing on the local market because it's vibrant. 
and not so much on the domestic market because it cannot compete. The fourth big issue here is the gross misallocation of government resources. I'm talking here about debt servicing, but then that can be changed if you have a sort of reasonable monetary policy. Right? And again, it's sort of the orthodoxy of the IMF is that if inflation goes up, even if it's because of supply factors like the price of fuel, price of utilities, or the fact that the EU is weakening, their solution is increased interest rates, which I think most practical people in this country realize will have absolutely no impact on inflation. Okay, so debt servicing is built in, but it can be brought down because interest rates are policies. The other problems are administration, the government machinery, which is huge. Even after the 18th Amendment, it, the, instead of shrinking the machinery, it's getting larger. Uh, the protocol and all the stuff that goes with the government machinery. And you also have to talk about defense. It's a huge chunk of public spending. And because of these big states, uh, you don't have enough for essentials. It is education, health, clean water, and uh, you know, so. So our, our investments for the future are extremely inefficient. And that's why there is, and, and there is no vision in terms of what needs to be done, because I think every government that comes in, whether it has to because of the system, this continues to prolong what has been happening for decades. You have bloated state-owned enterprises. Instead of restructuring them, they have become patterns of political dispensation of favors. They are inefficient, they are bloated, and they are drained on national exchequer. Then you have, because of all these reasons, you have a very short term investment horizon in the private sector. There is absolutely no long term funding available in this country. No one saves in banks. Banks do not encourage long term deposits. Okay, so what you have in the private sector is very short term, one, two year turnover investments, which are very consumer driven. Okay, no one is interested in manufacturing because that takes a longer term horizon and needs longer term funding. Then you have, I would say, a politicized, unaccountable, and top heavy bureaucracy that is linked to the big business groups in this country. I would argue that like the World Bank has done. That the elite capture of policymaking is so acute in this country, I think it might be perhaps the worst in the world. That is, a few groups, the elite, the, the landlords, the politicians, the bureaucracy, some in the army, and obviously big business, determine all policies to suit their interests. Then the last next point, obviously, which is no surprise, is corruption has become a business law. No one's ashamed of it. It's just business as usual. You know, you've got to pay rent seekers everywhere in the government machinery. Okay. You want to get anything done, you have to pay money. And the last thing, which comes from, I think, just the sad state of our political system, is there's absolutely no policy continuity in this country. There is no ideology in terms of where this country should go. Uh, there is no vision for what goals this country should try to achieve. Uh, every time a new government comes in, it reverses the policies of the previous government because of score settling. And that's how it even happened now, right? You have the incumbent government that's been in power for a year, that's still blaming the previous government for all the economic ills. And you know that the next government that's going to come in is going to do something similar as well. So, I mean, there's this combination of all these factors where everyone says there's no, there's no thinking, there's no planning. It's as if it's like, yeah, you know, you're going to be there for a couple of years, just make the money, and you don't know what's going to happen, right? These are the structural impediments in this country, and these are very deeply ingrained. So, I mean, the thing is, the IMF says the same things, we tackle the same issues, but because we are unable to, because we're so comfortable with the system the way it is, because the elites, it suits them. So they don't want to change everything. So you keep muddling along, as we have been doing for the past 30 years. 
Right. Um, that so much of that makes uh, makes sense, and it seems like the writing is quite clearly up there for everybody to see. But will uh, will we take action in a timely way or not? That's uh, that remains uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, Ma'am Sarah, uh, love if you could add to this. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think I primarily agree with Dr. Mushtaq, everything that he has said. I mean, IMF is uh, basically uh, the time you buy to avoid a crisis. But the fact that you have been in a similar crisis for um, last 22 times shows that this is not a crisis, this is a veteran. And uh, this time the IMF is asking Islamabad to arrange guarantees for uh, new foreign loans. It's asking uh, for um, to release a budget which is with funds guidelines, allow the open market to determine the value of rupee. So uh, the point is that the, the fact that you have to go to, to IMF for 22 times speaks volumes. And you also ask if this is a norm for other developing countries. No, we're one of the... Uh, one of the few countries which are noted as a prolonged user of IMF. I think that is that is our failure. And uh, Dr. Mushtaq uh, notes that why is that we have to go every time. I see it as I, I want to go uh, 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 maybe a layer deeper where I want to talk about that why Pakistan goes through what it goes through. And I shared a small presentation with you whenever you are ready to play it, I mean, I would like to show some data there maybe that uh, why Pakistan where it is. Let me just uh, have that on display. Uh, just give me one second. You can continue talking and then let me know which slide uh, to go to. So. Yeah, so I was, I was, um, uh, we talk when it, when, when it happens, we talk about crisis. We talk a lot about, um, you know, fiscal deficits and all other kinds of deficits. And we talk about the current GDP growth. And I mean, I personally think what um, we don't talk about the real crisis of Pakistan is that uh, Pakistan does not enough invest enough in its uh, um, human capital. We don't have enough uh, electricity to run um, our, our industries. And we are just too many people. I mean, right now, what you see on your um, on your screen is data of uh, literacy rates. So if you can note this, there's a very interesting uh, study by an American economist called uh, Mary Jean Bowman, who says that 40% of adult literacy is needed to sustain growth. And industrialization basically needs at least 70 to 80% of literacy. So if you can see between 1990 to 94, you can see that China was almost at 80% and India is less than 50%. And this explains that why China was able to industrialize 25 years faster than India. But then there are also countries where uh, literacy rates are almost ideal, but still they are not able to industrialize. For example, um, uh, Sri Lanka. So if, if we look at the next slide, it shows that what inhibits um, industrialization when ideal literacy is achieved, it is a lack of power. It's actually the next slide after this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So industrialization is basically a function of cheap labor with cheap, reliable electricity. So only countries that have reached, that have skipped this pattern are actually oil rich countries. And, and then, the, I mean, if you if you just look at this slide, you would see that access to electricity, the difference between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, I mean, the numbers, they speak themselves, nobody has to explain them. And especially if you look at the uh, rural side, India, starting from 48%, went to 96%. Bangladesh, from 16%, went to almost 90%. And your rural has actually regressed when it comes to uh, power. And then that's why we don't see that grassroots GDP transformation that we would like to see in our peers. And the last, I mean, if you could go back a slide back, you would see family sizes. So the study that I was previously mentioning, the, the book, the, this time is different. It concludes that external debt default is an 
high fertility country phenomena. Because when you have too many people, the family size is big, you cannot save. When you cannot save, of course, then you are then you consume more and you need more money to come in. And this is exactly, and then if you look at how Pakistani people save, you would see that 80% of Pakistan's wealth is actually stuck in non-productive sectors like real estate. So when, for example, Noor's uh, economic status gets a little bit better and she wants to make an investment, the easiest investment is to make it in a piece of land. And that piece of land produces no jobs. It produces nothing you can export. So that's why the bubble, it keeps rising and the money, it keeps going up. Inequality keeps rising. And at the same time, you get poorer and poorer as a country. So family sizes and your saving instrument basically are what makes the rest of the economic growth in the country. So there's a very interesting research paper from IMF, which shows that China's one child policy resulted in massive accumulation of household savings, which you can only credit to smaller family sizes. So, I mean, the world has now shown that all kinds of methodologies work. You know, it could be a dictatorship and it could be a democracy and you could still see economic growth. But what you need to see is consistency of policies, smaller family sizes, literate people, 80%, less than 70 to 80% of literacy cannot get you industrialization. If you can just uh, uh, look at the rest of the uh, slides in this presentation, you would see that, you know, women are working more in Bangladesh and India. Which, uh, no, not in India, but in India, you would see in the next slide, women are out of, of jobs because they're educating they are getting secondary education and when you get secondary education you're basically prepping your population to be fit to work in industries and to, and in services that's that's where the money comes in so if you can look at uh, these uh, numbers uh 2.5 percent is the 2.5 years is the school life expectancy in uh, secondary education in uh, female in uh, Pakistan, and it's uh, 3.2 for male. In Bangladesh, it's actually higher for women. Women are staying higher in schools and in jobs. And in India, you could see there is no inequality of education, at least at a higher secondary level. In, in. So this is basically you are pre prepping your population to become skilled workers. You have a large population which is unfit to work anywhere. Then where do you utilize that kind of population? And then you also have a power crisis. What would you do? You will, of course, be stuck in a poverty situation. That's, um, this is gross enrollment ratio. Yeah, I mean, it just, uh, yeah, I think it's laying out the fact that structural reforms are needed, not just uh, in an economic, uh, to solve an economic problem, but also to solve a bit of a societal problem as well. When we see children out of school, when we see that there are no jobs out there for young people, youth unemployment, for example, and we see so many factors that are contributing to that high fertility rates and declining education rates. And it's also uh, such a travesty. Um, I was speaking to a couple of uh, uh, women in education uh, some time back, uh, leaders in education leading non from leading nonprofits and they also specify that our government, because of certain political reasons, find it so easy to shut down internet access across the country. And for countries like Nigeria, for example, they were able to enhance uh, enrollment uh, in primary education during the COVID crisis by relying on digital tools and internet access. And they have been able to move forward and educate their children more. But in countries like Pakistan, suspending internet for a week is kind of a modus operandi for most of our uh, stakeholders. And it's a, it's, a, it's a sad situation to see when it results in perennial crises like these. Um, Ma'am Sarah, would you like to talk a little bit about this, uh, this particular slide as well, percent of firms using yeah, banks? Yeah, I mean, this is related to how um, uh, we save and what happens to. So in any society, basically your small SMEs uh, which are small and medium enterprises are the are the backbone 
right? So I was looking at some graphs and I this data came across and this is the percentage of firms which are using banks to finance investment. Of course, business needs finance, right? Business, uh, business to finance is like air to lungs. So basically, when these small ideas come, like somebody, for example, Noor starts, wants to start a cafe um, and she wants to employ five people, where does she go? If she goes to a bank, will the bank borrow, her, lend her money? So if you look at the data, we look at that Pakistan's money, I mean, 70% of the borrower, it's the government. So 70% money just directly goes to the government. 30%, the, the little portion that is left, all of that money goes to large uh, industries and the money for small SMEs, it basically comes from friends, family. There is no formal finance for SMEs. And this is, and I mean, if we if we just compare it to, we're not comparing Pakistan to say Germany or the USA, we're just comparing it to its own previous parts, India and Bangladesh. I mean, if India and Bangladesh can do it, we are left with no excuse to not do it. I mean, look at just South Asia. South Asia is not one of the richest part of the world, but even in South Asia, you look at that there are, uh, there is some portion it's it's acceptable that the largest portion is still with the biggest uh, firms, but there's still a significant portion of finance through bank going to small and medium uh, firms. But in Pakistan, you can see it's non-existent. And that is why you see no growth. You see no, G you don't see any, any significant change. Very fair points. Um... I would like to pitch a question based on this discussion to both Dr. Mushtaq and um, Ma'am Sarah to you as well. Um, is it okay if I stop sharing this presentation? Yeah, so, please. Okay, thanks so much, thank you. Um, but in kind of getting a sense of how deep our structural problems run, um, what should be the top immediate economic priorities for our government? Like what should be the one thing that they can target that could maybe in 15 years resolve at least some of the problems that we are discussing? Is it population control? Is it education? Um, what, is there a silver bullet? Uh, I think that's the, that's, that's the question to ask. And if not, what's the closest thing that can come uh, in terms of mitigating some of these um, issues? Uh, over to Dr. Mushtaq and then Ma'am Aisha. I think, uh, note that you said, are you asking about the lowest hanging fruit or something of that sort? Yeah, the lowest hanging fruit, yes. Yeah. I have an issue with that term simply because it suggests minimal effort mm. and getting a bigger reward. And I think that's what we've been doing. And now we are where we are. I mean, I would actually, you know, if you are talking about a pretty systemic change, which is, I think, what this country needs, sort of a, a reset or a sobering realization, then you need to do the hard stuff. Or at least mentally prepare yourself as opposed to, like, you know, try to find an easy way out. So I've sort of listed a few things. I mean, you want to really show intent. Uh, then follow your neighbor, India. India demonetized the rupee 2016 and is planning another similar demonetization of its 7,000 rupee flow. We know that the use of currency in Pakistan as a share of, say, bank deposits is one of the highest in the world. I think maybe Zimbabwe and a few hyperinflation Latin American countries may have the same quantum of currency, but people hoard currency, right? It's unaccounted for, there's no financial links, there's no documentation, right? A threat of that sort which would signal intent. You say that, look, you know, enough of this hiding your money and your wealth, uh, you've got to come to me. The second thing is, I would dismantle this whole non pilot you know, it's not like I choose not to fire. We have all the information we need. Most of the wealth in this country is in real estate. Real estate doesn't disappear. The old real estate plots have a beneficial owner. 
It just takes a matter of someone sitting there, going and determining who these people are, and saying, do you pay your taxes or not? And if not, why? And finding a way, because a lot of people who are extremely wealthy are wealthy because they have a large number of real estate assets. Why don't you target them? Right? Uh, the other thing is like, you know, digital lifestyle. Discourage the use of currency, force everyone as much as possible to get onto online payments, cell phone payments. That way you can generate a lot of data that way, then you can identify people who actually have a lot of money. I mean, when I was at the state bank, I could, with someone's CNIC, tell you how many cars that person has, how many bank accounts that person has, how many international trips he's made. Everything is there. We just lack the political will to take action because a lot of the people in power are themselves sort of using all these state avenues to stay undocumented. So, and then the last thing obviously is rationalize your expenditures. I mean, if you look at countries that have evolved, and I would say countries that have graduated from the army, okay, a great classic example is Turkey. Right up to 2003, Turkey for the past, before that 40 years, was engaged with the IMF almost every year, 40 years. And they had 10 consecutive one year standby programs in the 60s. One year, one year, one year. So they were the best friend of the army. Okay, even better than we are. Eventually, they decided, I think it was Erdogan, but certainly the timing was when he came to power in 2003, 2004, when they did some very radical reforms. In December 2004, the IMF program ended, they've never gone back to it. India, on off, on off with the IMF. Then they had the final program, which happened with the foreign exchange crisis in the early 90s. By, I think, December 93, they graduated from the IMF and now they're the fifth largest economy in the world. Right? Because they did the tough stuff. India was exactly like Pakistan. Currency circulation was at our levels. Currency circulation over bank deposits. We demonetized, it was very disruptive, but it worked. And now India is digitalized to the point where you can go and buy a pawn and basically use a credit card or use your phone. That is information, but everyone. You have that information, you just don't have the political will to do it. That's why we keep failing with the IMF. They will come up and say what they do to every other country, which is a standard thing. Maybe the ideology I disagree with is free market neoliberal stuff, right? But the fact of the matter is they don't want to solve your problem. You have to solve your problems. And you don't want to do that. Simple as that. Right. Um, very key points. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I agree with, again, uh, Dr. Mushtaq about what he said. Um, there are no one-pointers ever. I mean, you cannot fix this whole mess with a single point. But of course, at the same time, there are a set of actions that can be taken at any given point, which can improve this whole situation. For example, I think that if Pakistan works on three indicators, which are its uh, literacy, its... Uh, um, electricity and its fertility rates. I think it can, in say 15 years, you would see a lot of progress. And for energy conservation, I mean, it's there was a time when people couldn't think of using anything else for making a call other than landline. But then that and that technology became so outdated and so expensive because a newer te technology came, which were mobile phones. So I think a similar thing would happen for Pakistan uh, with all the solar technology which is coming now, because these are now so expensive and with every passing day. So basically what I'm trying to say is that you have to transition to green energy, not for saving the planet, but saving your own country. You just cannot uh, continue to afford, you cannot afford to make uh, energy from imported 
dollars. You just don't, don't have the money. And you have to regulate and you have to make sure that it's very difficult to invest in non-productive sectors or at least incentivize the productive sectors. For example, Russian digital account, when it came, it was celebrated like it was, it was taken as a positive step. But at the same time, it only incentivized investing in real estate, in stocks, in cars. It, you could also give charity, but you cannot invest in, say, agriculture in it. So if you continue to ignore your comparative advantage, which is the, it's it's bread and butter for millions of your. So I mean, if there, there can be systems where you can actually invest in your SMEs. If I am an overseas Pakistani and I can buy a car for my family here, there should be a way that I can also invest in a piece of land which will actually produce something. There should be a mechanism here. And then there's this question of digital digitalization, which is where one way could be demonetization. And there's a lot of there's a lot said that India went through a lot of disasters. But India, the first time India did this, it was like 10 years ago. And uh, the systems were not that developed. Now, Pakistan can also think of something like that. And maybe we can we can test and try it, take small steps because we have money. It's just not in the banks. And then another thing I would like to say is that uh, no government intervention in uh, price settings. Uh, for example, in uh, 2012, you had a Supreme Court uh, actually set aside a notification to the government of Punjab, which regulated a price for samosa. Now, those kind of things, you cannot expect a market to work well when you have the top institution in the country coming in between uh, price setting. And these are the things that we could do immediately. But this has an exception of wheat. Wheat is that one product for which lines are formed and people actually die getting it. So of course, that is justified. justified but other than then, I don't uh, I don't want the government to intervene in, intervene in uh, price setting. Uh, what we could do is that we uh, somehow incentivize or criminalize not getting women into education and jobs. I mean, it's high time. Fertility rates, I mean, we can study Iran. Iran is an Islamic country, and it is an excellent case study for bringing down your uh, fertility. Quickly, we could look at that. There could be higher transparency in public uh, projects. Um, you could uh, also make rural sustainability based on urban sustainability based on rural sustainability. So these are some of the things that Pakistan can do to not repeat its previous mistakes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarah, again, for uh, Ma'am Sarah, for these points and uh, for that presentation as well. I am I'm receiving a lot of really, really interesting questions already from our audience. Again, just to uh, reiterate, uh, for those who are watching, you can comment on our uh, YouTube live stream and pose your questions there. And you can also send us questions on uh, Twitter as well. Uh, I have my own list of questions that I want to get through first before I uh, come to those. So uh, that's just that. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because uh, apart from our structural problems, uh, we also in Pakistan, we have a tendency to blame the global economy for a lot of, uh, uh, lot of problems that are happening in Pakistan. We tend to blame, for example, rising oil prices uh, internationally as one of the reasons uh, we have inflation in this country. and. That is, of course, a very, very understandable connection. But given the, for example, recent Russia-Ukrainian conflict, as well as other global economic challenges, um, Dr. Mushtaq, I would like to ask you, um, what are some of the most significant global economic challenges that are impacting not just Pakistan, but the global South from imposition of sanctions to a strong US dollar? What is it that is really, really impacting the global South? Uh, and of course, Pakistan comes under that as well. So if you can shed some light on yeah. that. That's uh, I mean, look, you see, you've got to put it in context. I mean, this pandemic is now over. Although, let's be honest, it wasn't that bad for Pakistan compared to most of the rest of the world. Although we tend to blame everything on that. It is what we do, right? We blame yeah. not ourselves, we blame external factors, the US, China. Prices, one price, one price, one price. 
there is a problem across the board with emerging markets, many of them, in terms of their debt. Just like Pakistan, it's all alone. Sri Lanka is only seen. Zambia, Ghana, a bunch of uh, Latin American countries. Uh, you know, this is something that will take time for them to overcome, just like it will for Pakistan. Uh, the Ukraine war really has created volatility in commodity prices, and we still do not know how this will play out. Uh, just recently, I, I read that uh, because oil prices are soft, OPEC Plus is thinking about cutting oil production. So, you know, that downward trend, which would have been very beneficial to Pakistan, that may not last. And there's a final point, which I mean, you know, there are two other points I mean. One is globally, you've got to understand uh, since 2008, 2009, when you have the Great Recession, uh, you've had almost a zero interest rate environment globally. Money was super cheap. In fact, you had negative interest rates in some countries, uh, like in you know, Japan and some Nordic countries. That is, if you place money in a bank, you would actually have less. Uh, in a year than what you face. You know, I was negative interest, right? From there, you move pretty rapidly into higher interest rates because inflation in the OECD is a net of highs. So adjusting to that has not been easy. That's why there's so much confusion about why Europe is not doing well, why the US is doing well, and what the outcome for Japan is. So everything is sort of in a bit of a mess, right? But I would say, and I think you know, you talked about this in your note, is to say, you know, some of the bankruptcies we've seen in, in the US is that, or even Credit Suisse, is that an indication of some sort of global crisis in the making? It isn't. I think it's a very contained problem. I think it was poorly managed banks uh, that could not adapt or adjust to the fact that interest rates increased sharply, right? So I think it's not a systemic problem. It was going to be unique to a few countries, a few institutions, because they need circumstances. But the real problem, I think, for emerging market countries, and certainly the South that we talk about, is taking sides in the China-US test. There's no denying it, right? Pakistan is stuck in the middle, although it tends to be closer to China. But uh, I think the, the distancing from the US has also had repercussions. Our political system is mixed. We, there are some parties who are far more US based or we reference the US and some who are, who are big anti US. But unfortunately, the way the US and China are swaying off at this point, this problem is not going away. And we are in the unfortunate position where we may have to take sides. Right? And we, at this point, we've got one leg in both boats. And those boats are drifting apart. And our economy is a mess, right? So we have absolutely, we are compelled now to do something about this, our own economy, because only we can do it, so that we don't have, we're not a fall in the US-China standard, which at this point we are, okay? So, you know, the challenge for a lot of southern countries, and obviously with this Belt Road Initiative of China, and the fact that you know Sri Lanka and many Latin American countries, not but many South uh, such Latin American countries, and a few Latin American countries are also in debt with China, right? Now the US is playing that up to basically disturb China. Clearly, I mean they're, they're competitors, right? Now, those who were stuck in the middle. Are going to have a very hard time. And that's why the urgency for us to fix ourselves is, is cannot be overemphasized. Because if we've done what we have been doing, which is nothing, you know, just sort of spend a year doing something or the other, you'll find yourself you know, as a problem, right? Going between two sides and not going to be both. These are very, very key points um, that you've raised, Dr. Mushtaq, and just uh, talking about them a little bit more, it is a little bit, uh, uh, it's heartening to hear that we might not be at the cusp of another global uh, recession and that what happened at Credit Suisse or the Silicon Valley Bank might have been a smaller contained 
uh, issue, not something that would spill over and result in a recession for most. But uh, based on what did happen with uh, the Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, what would you, how would you comment on the overall health of the global financial or the global banking system? And also just highlighting very recently, Pakistan was placed on the gray list of uh, the Financial Action Task Force. Here at RSIL, we actually worked very closely with the government in uh, understanding what those demands were and creating knowledge products uh, on the same and trying to understand how these global financial bodies or watchdogs operate. And it does seem that there is a very, very, very fine line for, for Pakistan or other countries of the global south for them to be nominated in such lists and for these organizations to impose such stringent recommendations that choke financial activity or economic activity, for example, due to increased due diligence measures, so on and so forth. So for not just for Pakistan, but for the global south, um, what does all of this mean? And uh, is do you see an alternative rising up in the form of China-based China banks or China-based multilateral institutions? Mm -hmm. Is that a viable option uh, at all or in terms of, uh, in the practicality of things, as you uh, as you see it, uh, these are very very far off options uh, at this moment. If you can just comment a bit about these developments, that'd be great. Thank you. But I, I think the point you raised is is it's very important, and it's it's uh, it needs to be addressed. I mean, let's let's be very honest. Uh, the U.S. Western and Chinese economic models are very very good. Okay. Uh, and I tend to have more preference for the Asian. I'm not a free market neoliberal person. I don't think markets are the way forward. Um, you know, I think a certain amount of central planning and oversight of the government is very important, especially in setting up long term goals. Rich countries like uh, India and Vietnam, China have since been done. But there's no denying that today there is a very different model. And at this point, I think you know AIIB, the Chinese uh, international financial institution, uh, ha doesn't have a mandate to do what the IMF does, right? And, if, and that's not the goal. But what is interesting, and it's nice to keep this in mind, is because of China's growing strength, this is the first time that the Bretton Woods system. The IMF and the World Bank and all these other agencies that have been created after the World War II by the US are being challenged. Right? Now, if that break keeps getting larger, then you may have a situation where the China sort of withdraws from the IMF and maybe creates a sort of an equivalent for its countries or countries that. Uh, so closer to China, uh, and you could have effectively a bipolar global financial system. See, what you've got to realize is the Cold War of the 20th century, the USSR was not an economic player. It was technically a basket, right? It was militarily very powerful, but it had no say in global trade or commerce, right? But that's different from China. So just like the U.S. needed uh, some say in how the global financial system would work after World War II, you may have, you know, you may see that China will also try to assert its economic model, which would work very well for itself, uh, on other countries and sort of move away from this market orientation, which honestly I don't think has really helped Pakistan because that's, you know, when you say the market will determine anything, everything. What you're doing is you're basically empowering big business, which is the market. And instead of them competing, they basically fix the policies to suit their interests. So everything is market based, but it's all short term thinking, and you go from doing to bus in two years, three years, right? It is no long term thinking. So your social development, your investment in human beings cannot happen by the market, it has to be done by the state. And unfortunately, our state is not interested in these sort of issues. So maybe if the Chinese model becomes more and more relevant, we may borrow from them. 
And so we'll say, okay, this is the way we do it. I hope it is. Um, Dr. Mushtaq, how hard would it be to balance this for the government, for example, investing in human development in Pakistan, but at the same time trying to secure an IMF bailout, which again prioritizes harsh austerity measures? Um, it seems like we're in between a rock and a hard uh, uh, situation. No, I, I, I would disagree there. I mean, I think the IMF is actually quite clear in saying that, look, you know, if we need to ensure that the underprivileged and the vulnerable are taken care of. Right? So they've been very positive on social protection uh, programs, schemes, uh, BISP, you know, the sound thing, this health card, blah, 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 blah. So it's not the IMF that would resist. In fact, the IMF would insist and support it. And in, and in their targets, they have minimum levels that have to be spent on development of education and other stuff. The problem is on our side, okay? Because we are really not interested, and the politicians are not interested, right? Their political power comes from basically suppressing the people, right? And, you know, the thing is like, you know, if they get educated, then, uh, you know, they'll get out of the control or something of the sort. It's this very really feudal mindset that we have. And that goes back to history, even, you know, back to 1947. I mean, people have made an argument to sort of say that Pakistan, its ideology was actually more inclined towards the feudal power that existed in West Pakistan, right? So, you know, I think that's where the real issue is. It's whether we as a nation prioritize our people, and we don't, okay? So, in fact, I would say that the IMF does much more than we do. Which is actually such a, uh, it's refreshing to hear this perspective because uh, not just in Pakistan, but in a lot of uh, uh, places in the global south, there is a very harsh anti-IMF sentiment that just these big new liberal uh, uh, economic policies are there to choke the global south and never let it uh, develop uh, properly. And there may or may not be uh, some truth behind it, but at, at its very course, as you just mentioned, and I think summed it up very succinctly, like prioritizing the people is something that, particularly in Pakistan, that should be the priority, of course, uh, putting people uh, first and uh, ensuring that human development is happening before trying to see how not development developing in humans results in economic crises and poly crises that come up again after every five years or 10 years. So those are very fair points. Um, on the topic of, again, global politics and global governance uh, broadly, um, is there a particular camp that Pakistan, or even if you ignore Pakistan, but should the global South aim for one specific camp, either we join the US camp or the China camp? Are the lines that clearly divided? Uh, what do you see? I, yeah, thank you. This is how I would argue. I mean, the thing is like, you know, I would say that the IMF or this sort of Washington consensus ideology, right, neoliberal, is too encompassing. It's too, you know, broad. And the thing is like, you know, uh, the programs, that the IMF has and the whole bunch of these agencies follow that one ideology. Right? Some exceptions can be made, but broadly it has to be market based, has to be private sector, has to be no planning, you know, no government intervention. Uh, I think the Asian model allows for more customization, right? They will look at the country, they will look at its problems, they will focus on certain areas, and and and, for, and and get things done. You know, it may not be the markets and all this stuff. It may be a very strong government presence. But think about it. I mean, let's be very honest. Singapore, Vietnam, China. These are centrally thought out, centrally planned, effectively police states. Where I would say the citizens, like Mr. Singapore, would be happy to give up their political rights for economic prosperity. The rules are very clearly stated. The judicial system is extremely fair, but the rules are there. You pay by the rules, you make money, you do well, right? 
So, I mean, the thing is, I think that level of customization is alien to the West, or they will not allow it, right? And that's why we need to have the strength to be able to chart our own direction. We've fallen way behind all the countries in South Asia, and now even behind Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, that's embarrassing. Where we were in the 60s, where we were in the 70s, and where we are now, I mean, it's people need to pause and think, right? You are 250 million people, the fifth the most popular, populous country in the world, and pharmaceutical companies, international pharmaceutical companies are leaving Pakistan, the fifth largest market. What does that mean? It means you're dysfunctional. And the thing is, like, our politicians are pointing fingers at each other, and we have these pet projects which we will never touch, right? Oh, no, no, no. They have to have their budget, they have to have their, everyone has to have their budget. Who doesn't get the budget? The people. Oh, it doesn't matter. How long will this continue? And we have examples of countries where you were ahead of them, including your neighbors, who are way ahead of you now. You have a country like Turkey that defied the West in terms of its economic policies and, and still defies them, and yet it is doing well. So that level of customization, that level of leadership is something that we haven't had for 30 years, not more. And this musical chairs we're going to be playing with elections is not going to solve anything. Honestly, I don't think. Right, it's just creating the grounds for further strife and creating more uncertainty all around. Um, in terms of, um, it's a, uh, we have this very interesting question coming from our director of research. And uh, I would like to ask both uh, Dr. Mushtaq and uh, Ma'am Sara, uh, Sara if, you're, if you're still there. Um, we have traditionally looked at all major issues in Pakistan from a very security-based lens. Um, is, this going to, uh, is this going to destroy us as a country? Uh, is this like an external security threat, et cetera, et cetera? And the question is whether this approach has negatively impacted our economic development, or is it something that we just couldn't do given the regional dynamics that we have and some of the territorial disputes that we inherited after the partition? Um, if any of you could uh, take a stab at this. Um, look, I think in the initial stages, uh, yes, there was a lot of uncertainty and obviously you know, the wars in the 20th century with India and the philosophies of Pakistan. Uh, but we do tend to overplay this then. Uh, I think as we've seen, Ukraine is, is, is an interesting and unique example. But I can't think of any country that would invade Pakistan. You know, you invade a country which has natural resources, which has you know, people of a certain you know, uh, caliber, right, to gain strength. Coming into Pakistan is going to be a disaster. I should think it's like, you know, so, you know, wars are not, I mean, wars are not military. Wars are economic. Right? Uh, India is going to become a superpower. It already is. Uh, and the thing is, it's not really bothered with us. You know, I mean, the thing is, it's looking at China, it's looking at the US, it's trying to chart out its own non aligned position in the world, which may have started in the uh, partition. So, I mean, we also have to understand that, you know, a strong security apparatus uh, is it against uh, foreign invasion? Who's going to invade? And for what end, right? Or is it more to keep control in the country, right? Um, and I think that's what's playing out now. And I think it's a very, it's a very interesting time because we have an acute economic crisis. I mean, you've never been in the past. You couldn't see the word before, and now you're asking your first question is about right? So times have changed. Uh, then you have this political crisis, you have this constitutional crisis. You have for the first time the army coming out as a very active participant in uh, political, economic, or whatever the spheres of uh, Pakistan and life. But this 
this hasn't been the case before. Right? So that's also uh, a step in the right direction. I mean, people are thinking about it and reflecting on it. And maybe, as you said, the silver lining of the reset is, uh, is a hint to the status quo. To say that, look, you know, let's think about the future a little differently. Because what you've done or sustained for the past three decades, you cannot sustain anymore. And unless that realization dawns on you, you will get into the cycle of going to the IMF and then after six months or two quarters or three quarters, not meeting targets, having the program suspended, and you know, it just keeps going on. Ma'am, Sarah, do you have any comments on this? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think I primarily agree with Dr. Murtag. I'm sorry, I'm not a student of international relations. So I study microeconomic household data. So I really can't, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have a definitely a definite answer over there. But I do think that like, you know, division of pie is uh, one topic. Size of pie is one topic. This pie is just too small. We're too many people and we're not putting in enough ingredients in the pie to make it bigger. I think that's a, I, I love that analogy so much that the pie is way too small and uh, yet the people just, we're just adding more and more uh, shaders uh, of the pie. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit between the global situation and Pakistan's uh, position as well. Um, I do have one question which is quite interesting and it's uh, a little bit regional, so I guess in between, but... Um, how bad is it if we actually do start trading with India? It's interesting because when it comes to the question of trade uh, and uh, we've seen Pakistan struggle at an operational level, very much so with the fact that we have sanctioned Afghanistan and sanctioned Iran to, um, to our West. And then we have India to the East, but because of security-based concerns, we've sus suspended trade relations with them. And even though the countries uh, of Afghanistan and Iran aren't technically uh, sanctioned, it's certain individuals or certain sectors or certain groups within it. Um, banks in Pakistan, for example, are so wary of uh, dealing with any Iranian or Afghani transaction that it's just hard for any trade or meaningful trade relations uh, to go through. So within this regional aspect and in order to curb some of the economic crises that, that we have right now. Uh, is trade with India an option that we should be pursuing from an economic uh, perspective? Uh, I'll go for Dr. Mushtaq and then Ma'am Sarah, you can add your comments. Look, I mean, trading with your neighbors is, it's, you know, it's, it makes perfect sense. But the point is like, you know, I mean, I can remember a time, when was our old I when Samsung, this we're talking about 1997, wanted to set up a manufacturing unit uh, near Islamabad and Lahore and target India as the market because they said the infrastructure in Pakistan is there. Okay, obviously we didn't do it, but then we allow Pakistan to export to, to India. And, and you know what's happened. Right. India built up its infrastructure. Now they don't even need Samsung, they have their own brands. Right. Uh, so, you know, India is a massive market, but the thing is, I'll tell you where the resistance is going to come. It's going to come from our big businesses. It's going to come from, you know, businesses that feel they're going to get swamped by a more efficient or by cheaper products, you know. Um, like, let's say autos, right? That's a, that's an obvious one. Indian cars. Now they're going to electric cars, right? You know, we should have when CPEC started in 2014, 2015. I I argued that it was hijacked uh, by the government at that time. Focus on power because of the state. But if you look at the original CPEC, it was talking about trade. It was talking about industrial settlements. It was, talk, it was effectively a blueprint for an industrial policy for Pakistan. And I remember at that point saying, if this can transform it, because that's exactly what we need. We need an industrial policy. We need some forward thinking. 
and who better than the Chinese, right? Since they sort of transformed themselves. But instead of that, look at opposition, right? We all went into power and now we can't pay for So we not do the high things that have been created. So to answer your question, we should be trading with everyone, with India, with China. And the thing is like, even though our established exports may not be able to compete, we will discover markets, new markets, which will arise right, if that opportunity is created. India is a very rich country. I mean, they are 50% richer, the average Indian, than we are, right? And used to be at par with them maybe 10 years ago. And their outlook is extremely positive. Right? So the issue is if you can hold off or deal or interact with a country that's going to be growing very rapidly in the next 20 25 years, right? You're set. You know, even if you get a small niche of it, it's more than enough. But then you have to get over your historical concerns. And, you know, that's why we carry so much luggage of the past, either institutions or memories or ideology, that, you know, you're stuck in this sort of bizarre time war where everyone's gone ahead 30 years and you're still back in the 1980s. And we're not progressing from there onwards no, or really. meeting any of the new challenges. One uh, aspect uh, is, although missing from our discussion, but is of course at the background of uh, anything related to Pakistan is the fact that with climate change, for example, we have every other year we have to battle um, and pour funds into essentially reconstructing certain parts of our country after major floodings, uh, what have you, and this is, uh, also concerning for us and just reinforces the need for the need and the urgency to fix ourselves first, given that the challenges that we now have uh, on top of all the existing geopolitical, um, international uh, challenges, we have climate change based challenges as well that are hindering us. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit towards the questions that the audience has been uh, sending us. First of all, a huge thanks to them for participating in this as well. So uh, this is a question that uh, is open to the to either Dr. Mushtaq or Ma'am Sa Sara, whoever wants to take a stab at it, but should Pakistan get rid of the 5,000 currency note? Uh, how, and this is within the backdrop of how do you bring money tied in real estate into the formal documented economy? What would be the short-term challenges? Uh, can we replicate successfully the Indian model uh, in this regard? Um, I'm opening the floor up to anyone who wants to answer this. We talk about demonetization. I used to be at the state bank <laughs> at stage. And I wrote an internal paper about precisely that. Right. Let's right. demonetize the 5,000 people. <laughs> My colleagues lost their money. The thing is, they are asking the price for going crazy. Look, it is a very decisive step. Now, the thing is, you know, in those days, in those days, mm -hmm. you and this I'm talking about uh, 2009. Okay. ATMs would not give you 5,000 notes. You would not see a 5,000 notes for months. Right. Right. That's changing. So now getting rid of it is going to be interesting. But the thing is, you see, the way you have to see it is this. For people who are documented, who have bank accounts, okay, or who are small savers, right? It's very simple for them to sort of say, it's like, look, you know, okay, fine, you know, here's the 5,000, deposit in my bank or give me another note or whatever it is. Is the people who are boarded, like not suitcases, the blue that's where the issues are, right? Because then they'll have to, when they come to exchange it or to place the money or to bring all this cash back into the system, uh, they'll have to explain, right? So say it's like, yeah, you know, why am I holding like you know, three billion rupees worth of currency? Right? So it's 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 enough to keep a lot of people out, but the thing is, like, you know, it will actually impact those people the most who are. Hoarding. It's not going to impact me at all. And I don't think it'll impact either of them, right? But it will impact some people severely. But the issue is that's just the first step. I think, you know, what you should be doing is that what I think India has done 
is to say that there are no cash, tra cash transactions beyond 50,000 rupees. Right? Anything beyond 50,000 rupees has to be a check or has to be a payable. That is simple to do. Automatically, you have a name, you have an address, you have CNIC, boom, moving one step towards documentation. Now, the thing is, like, you know, getting real estate now, real estate has only had some transition. You know, before your official value was reached fifteen percent of the real value, right? Now it's maybe 75. Uh, step in the right direction. Move it to 85, move it to 95, right? And then impose that tax, you know, a small turnover tax or whatever it is, but at least get, then you would know exactly what people are worth. And as I said, since most of your wealth, I would say 85%, of Pakistan wealth is in real estate. You don't save in banks. You don't save in uh, mutual funds. You certainly do not save in the stock market. You save in jewelry and you save in real estate. That's it. And everyone says Pakistanis are far richer than on paper. Of course we are because we're hiding it. Unhiding it is not impossible. It's disruptive. It's not impossible. But who's going to resist it? It's going to be our politicians. I wonder why. Um, it's interesting because uh, working with the FATF, for example, what the what the FATF was telling the government was to target uh, what it called DNFPPs or designated non-financial businesses and professionals. And who are these people? These are your accountants, lawyers, uh, jewelry businesses, and real and the real estate sector. And the reason why they specifically um, highlighted these professions was that when it comes to money laundering, for example, the easiest way to park proceeds of crime or bribery money or any in any criminal way that you receive money from, the easiest way to do that is buy some property or buy some jewelry, and not just in Pakistan, but around the world. And interestingly, in the last, uh, last four years, Pakistan, the Pakistani government has worked a lot uh, in order to try and bring these sectors into the realm of formal governance, but it is an uphill challenge because the rules have been made uh, on paper, who is gonna enforce them? And uh, the next question for us is, will, will the fact of realist, is, realist us again in the next five years or not? The question of implementation, of course, uh, is, is a separate debate entirely, but just wanted to briefly uh, discuss that. Um, I have one question for Ms. Sara specifically, which is, um, is a cultural reset foreseeable and practical? Uh, one of the major reasons for our stalling in these areas are, for example, cultural and religious hesitations when it comes to uh, population control, uh, family planning, gender, in uh, gender inequality, for example. Should our eco economic analyses take into account uh, these factors and how can we work around them and uh, have this cultural reset in place? Uh, as well, it's a very, very long-term kind of a question, but if you can take a stab at that. Cultural reset is not something that, I mean, uh, we cannot achieve even small goals. So to think about cultural reset, and more than cultural reset, I don't think that it's the culture. Uh, for example, if, for example, we could look at that, why are people not educating their kids and say, why are there such a big rate of school drop or so, or out of school children? You have to look at the returns of education. You have to see that when these families, and particularly in uh, the rural areas, having big uh, family sizes, these are not only their their these these kids basically are their retirement and their their investment as well. The more hands you have, the more likely you are to have more people earning that daily wage and bringing it them in. And at the same time, I see that that I choose that my kid goes to school, learning poverty is 80%, which means that even if your child makes it to school, there's an 80% chance that by the end of his financial uh, educational journey, he will not be able to solve a simple arithmetic question or read a simple line in Urdu or English. So mm -hmm. you see your child, now you have wasted all that years of him not him or her not earning with you. And at the end of the day, he's not employable anywhere. 
So basically, it's all about make, making educational returns better. <laughs> Sorry. And once, if you, if you give even five to six years of education to a girl, you see, then you don't have to convince her that much to have polio ke katre or vaccinations. So basically, that initial five to six years of education in, in a girl's life gives you, that's the cultural reset that you need. So you have to make sure that the education, I mean, why would I send my child to school if I see no benefit of that? So I don't think we need cultural reset, but we need, for example, instead of, they have been, but there has been enough money going into educational programs as well, but still the learning outcomes don't improve. And if you look at evidence, it shows that even a 500 rupees private school is comparatively educating better than an educational a government school, which means that the evidence now is pointing, and this is global evidence. So it's now pointing that instead of making more brick and mortar and giving more money to the government to uh, build more schools, what you could be doing is that you could be helping the private sector, for example, giving families education vouchers or some other kind of involvement of the private market and then improving because this, this improving through um, government bodies, it has seen that like, even if it is progressing, the cost is too big for Pakistan to afford. Now we are no longer able to borrow and pay back those loans and the result is still kids out of school and health indicators still too bad. Uh, very important points and I'm realizing that we are at the very end of our discussion as well. So I'm just going to take this one question, open it up to both of our panelists and uh, take that as a concluding remark as well. And also because um, primarily as we're joined by students and uh, um, the young population that is out there, uh, this question was posed on our YouTube live stream. Um, is there any light at the end of this tunnel? And it seems like the takeaway of this discussion is that we should all be looking for a lifeboat out of Pakistan. And that's the end quote uh, comment there is, but it just speaks to the level of despondency that is there in our, perhaps the biggest demographic that we have in this country. Um, Ma'am Sara and uh, Dr. Mushtaq, both if, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? If you can answer this question, um, anything that the youth of the box, uh, of this country can look forward to, uh, we can then conclude the session. I'll open this up to Ma'am Sara first. Um, so Noor, I would like to uh, tell the youth again, that see, uh, Reinhard and uh, uh, Rodolf that uh, in that study, they have pointed out that nearly every advanced economy has defaulted and they have still become advanced. And just by the way, if you get the IMF money, it, there's no guarantee that you not, you might not default. You might still default after getting the IMF uh, money. Oh. But but yeah. all and almost all of them had defaulted and they've still become advanced. And the point is that if after that period, if you work on the right indicators, you move away from subsidies to investments, you end your anti-export bias, you invest in your people, educating children. It's, I mean, if you even start today, 10 years later, 15 years later, you'll have a population which is educated. So, you know, investing in their skills, keeping close to institutions like IMF and World Bank so that your uh, your investors are reassured and you're doing it all to attract private sector investment it can all set, it can set you on the right path in say 10 years so this i mean the panic it's not as much because we tend to talk about it a lot so G and then gdp is strongly related to uh, demographic uh, uh, indicators so when fertility rate falls gdp growth it changes dramatically so Pakistan, if it, it doesn't need imported strategy, it doesn't need a commodity uh, price boom. What it needs, it, it needs a smaller families. It needs more so solar for, for higher, for more power. And it needs investment in basic education, power infrastructure, and your issues are fixed in say 20 years at max. Fingers crossed. Dr. Mustaq, uh, 
Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I think if, if your listeners are coming out and sort of being more pessimistic, uh, that's not the point. I think, as I said before, and I think you asked the right question is to say, is this reset important? And I said, this is in the line. Uh, understanding and sort of coming to this point of breaking down is something I suppose you're not talking about. Uh, it was actually it was actually good because you then understand exactly what is not sustainable. And we have not been sustainable for a while. And now I think it's going to come out to understand exactly why we're not sustainable. And then you look know, for people to then think this that you think your systems would not be able to work away. But they have, you need to change them. So you know, there's a there's a lot of upside. There will be the transition itself would be very disruptive, but understand will be more disruptive for the status quo than it is for the upper middle class or for the youth, you know, who are, you know, starting the career. You know, the thing is, like, as I said, like, if you realize that you cannot import as much as you do as you have, then local industries will step in. That's when the youth can find employment, right? That's something that I think is very positive and very optimistic in the sense that you know it is solving a problem that we have, which is like you know dependency on imports. Uh, it creates a certain amount of disruption at the top, will actually be motivational for a lot of people. There's a lot of resentment in this country. The income and wealth inequality is very stark, right? And seeing the people at the top suffer a little bit may actually be something that you know the middle class might want to see, right? And as long as you have a government that tells the truth and actually says that look, this is what we have to do, and an IMF sort of system that is willing to accommodate, because a country of this size could be problematic to the region if it if it sort of you know stays. Dysfunctional. So there may be a lot of regional support, even less support, to say that, okay, as a one off piece, you'll have to help this country out because we don't want anything else happening to it. And I think that itself should be a lot of good news for the, you know, to sort of say that, look, finally, this corrupted system is going to change or some change, credible change is going to happen. So they should come out of this a little optimistically. It'll be difficult. It'll be difficult. Transitions are not going to be easy. But it's not going to be easy for select people, especially it's going to be very hard for the rich and famous. The youth, I don't think they'll have it. Thank you so much again, Dr. Mushtaq and Ms. Sara for joining in. This was such a fruitful discussion and I learned so much uh, from this. Pakistan is at such a critical juncture when it comes to its own economy uh, in, in choosing allies, in choosing which global camp to fall side on, and of course in deciding to develop in its own human resources and improve its uh, human uh, uh, human resources as well. We've discussed so many different uh, areas and I again thank you so much for your time. To our viewers, I would really like to recommend uh, Dr. Mushtaq uh, updates uh, frequently on his website, Doctored Papers. Uh, a lot of interesting economic analyses. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, it is a high recommendation that they check that out. And uh, Ms. Sara Nizamani publishes regularly uh, on Dawn News, and I'm a very, very avid reader of her articles. Um, I'm very, very thankful to both of them that they joined me here today. And with this, I'm going to uh, uh, sign off on this session.